Today we're going to be replacing this water jacket on a 2002 Chrysler Sebring Convertible Limited 2.7 liter. This piece is very common to start leaking right along this lip right here. And the only solution is actually just to replace it. The part is located right here on the left side of the motor. And usually you'll see just a little bit of water bubbling out of this seam right here. So we want to take off these two electrical plugs. You simply slide this red tab up then depress that little button and it just slides right off. The second one has a tab right on the top of it. If you take a screwdriver and just push that tab down, it'll just slide off also. So we're going to take these hoses off of the water manifold. One of them has a squeeze clamp. The other has a hose clamp. Because there's no way to get down there to the other side of that thing to squeeze it. It's down below the edge of this valve cover so that you can't clamp it. We'll take a screwdriver and put it against the brace of that clamp and push. And you can actually rotate this thing around slightly so you can get it up to where you can get a pliers on that. Now let's use our pliers and we'll pull this clamp back. And for all you neat nicks that don't want to get a little bit of radiator fluid on your garage floor, you can drain it first, but I think we're just going to go ahead and just go for it. And it's out in the backyard anyways. Okay, now we'll go ahead and pull this hose and this will let the water out of this very top part of this. There's four bolts that hold on this hose bed. Three of them are very accessible. The fourth one is underneath the edge of the intake manifold. I tried to do it too in an experiment to see if I could get a wrench down there and possibly raise that nut up without having to raise this piece, and I was not able to do it. Hey, we'll be back in a little over 60 seconds, and we're gonna pause real quick to see if you need any eternal repair. You might say, eternal repair, what's that? Well, hey, consider your whole life, and all your life, have you ever told a lie before? I have, and I'm sure you have too. We all have. Also consider, have you ever stolen something, even no matter how small it was? I'm sure you have, and I have too. The whole point of where I'm going with this is those two rules, lying and stealing, those are two of the Ten Commandments in the Bible, which define what sin is. So if you've broken even one of those rules, no matter how small it was, that means you've sinned, and we all have. The punishment for sin is going to hell, or eternal separation from God. The good news is Jesus Christ came to this earth. He didn't lie. He didn't steal. He didn't do all these crazy stuff that you and I have done. He was totally without sin. He was sacrificed on the cross for my personal sin and yours. He went to the grave. Three days later, he defeated death, and now he sits beside the Father in heaven. The whole point of why he had to take that punishment on the cross was he was taking the punishment for your sin and for my sin. But it can only be accounted to you if through faith you believe in who he was, what he did, you submit to him as your Lord, and you repent. And when you do that, you can have eternal habitation with Jesus and the rest of the saints for eternity in heaven. You might be saying to yourself, hey, I'm a good person. Surely God wouldn't send me to hell for all the nice things I've done for people. But the truth of the matter is the Bible says, by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man or woman should boast. There is no amount of good work you can do to earn your righteousness before God. Only faith and trust in what Jesus has done for you on the cross. Hey, let's get back to our video, and I'll have a little more information on the eternal portion of this at the end of the video. One thing we noticed is that there was a lot of dirt and debris down in the bottom of these holes. But I was a little concerned about taking these bolts out and raising this thing up and some of the dirt falling down underneath there, not knowing if it would actually get into the manifold area of the vehicle. So we're going to take our air compressor first, and we're going to go ahead and blow out all the debris that's collected down there. There's seven 10 millimeter bolts that are down here in these compartments of this air breather. Leave them down here in these slots as long as they're totally unthreaded so they won't grab when you start to raise this thing up. You have one 10 millimeter bolt on top of this little cover. And once you pull the cover back, it exposes an eighth bolt that's down here on the manifold also. And we're going to go and pull this one out so we don't lose it when we raise this one up. And you can set something underneath the edge right here when you raise it up. So that gives you just enough room to get down there with an angled socket and get that last bolt that's on this water jacket. This juncture with the screwdriver lifting the front of this thing up, you could just continue and get all four bolts out of that water yoke and go ahead and finish your job. For our application, we had a lot of dirt and debris that were on top of the motor just underneath this intake manifold. And we're concerned that 
just raising it up, we may have some items that might fall down inside the engine. Once you remove this intake manifold, you can actually see the back sides of the valves inside the motor. So we're going to go ahead and take one more bolt out and get this whole manifold off there and then kind of take a flashlight and shine down inside the motor and make sure we didn't have anything fall down inside the motor on the back side of the valves. If you have a real good clean engine and there's not a bunch of debris, you could probably just go ahead and just remove the four bolts in that water yoke and be done with it at this point. Next, we need to pull this piece of plastic off of this intake housing. Okay, there's an electrical connection right here on top of this housing. And what you have to do is you first slide this red tab up. Once you slide it up, then there's a black button just above the red tab that you press in, and now you can pull this piece right off of here. There's a hose clamp right there where it goes into the intake manifold. You may have to have a screwdriver to kind of get underneath this rubber piece here and pull back. There's a vacuum hose connection right here on top of the airbox. You simply just slide that off. Next, you want to take out this 8 millimeter nut off the top of the airbox. There's a clip that hangs on the side of the airbox that has some connections on it. If you lift that straight up, the clip will actually just come off and then it'll hang freely. Now you're able to lift the airbox up and slide it out. It gets a little tight right here on the frame, but once you can clear that, now the whole thing will pull straight out just like this. When you go to put the box back in, there's a couple of rubber plug holes on the bottom of this box, and they have to line up on these two plugs that are down here in the bottom. You'll know you have it right if the distance from this computer is even all the way up and down this track. To get the manifold off, there's actually four vacuum hoses that have to be taken off to be able to lift it up. There's one extra bolt right underneath this breather yoke. It's right here, and if you take this one out, then this whole manifold will actually lift right up out of here. Now with the intake manifold off, actually use some paper towels to keep any debris or anything from falling down into the engine. And once we got this off, we had all kinds of acorns and dirt and everything that we had to clean up along these edges, along the valve covers. Now with the water out, now we can go ahead and take these four bolts out, assuring ourselves that we won't have water flowing backwards into our intake manifold. Okay, let's go ahead and get our four bolts out. Go ahead and lift this thing out of the way. Right along here is where they always leak. A lot of times this white gasket ends up staying on the motor. So you can see here the old one, how the gasket is no longer on it. So let's run back over here to the motor, and you'll see these gaskets are actually got left behind here on the engine block. So we'll go ahead and pull those out. Definitely do not want to reassemble this with two gaskets on it, because it would probably end up leaking. Okay, we'll take a razor blade and go ahead and clean this up just a little bit. I tried to find the torque settings for the water yoke, and it was not in my Haynes manual. They do have metal that goes through the whole shaft, but I'm going to get them snug, but I'm not going to over-tighten these because I certainly don't want to crack this plastic. According to the Haynes manual, for 2.7 liter V6 engines, the intake manifold bolts should be torqued to 105 inch-pounds, and there's a sequence that you should follow when you're tightening them, and you can pause this any time to follow this sequence. And here's what it has to say about reinstalling the intake manifold. You can pause it any time you want. One of the things I want to point out was the gaskets on the manifold that we took off are actually the rubber O-ring gaskets. So if you just raise the front edge of it and then take it back down, it should be fine resealing up. Fine, there is no radiator cap on the actual radiator in the front of the car. Instead, they have the fill tank, which is located right here. Once you have everything reinstalled and you've gone and refilled your tank with radiator fluid, you'll need to bleed this system. And if you don't bleed it, the car will actually run hot. So to do this, this is a 10 millimeter nut. We'll go ahead and open this one up. There's a couple different ways you can do this. Look a clear hose onto the top of this thing. And if you're using a clear hose so you don't drink any radiator fluid, you can actually suck out the air out of the top of the system. You'll notice every time I suck it, you'll see the line go down the side of the tank. Another way you can do this is if you have a vacuum tester, you can just keep pumping your vacuum tester. And, then, and you can see now that after I pumped it several times, we've actually got some radiator fluid now coming up through the bleed valve. Another way you can bleed it is after you've warmed the car up and the system's pressurized, put your wrench on there and just crack it open just a teeny bit. You have to be careful on this one. There you go just like that. Hey, as far as the internal portion I was talking about, if you're not sure you know who God is, 
I encourage you to just to pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, if you are real and you are out there, I pray you would reveal yourself to me in a tangible way. And when you make that prayer, he's going to answer it, and you will know he is real. At the point you know he is real and you're ready to accept him as your Lord and Savior, the gospel is so simple. All you have to do is just pray like this. Say, Lord Jesus, I recognize that you are the Son of God. You took the price for my personal sin on the cross. I surrender my will to your will as Lord of my life. I repent of my sin. Thank you for loving me, forgiving me, and accepting me into your eternal habitation. That's just how simple it is. But the catch is that just saying those words won't do anything for you, only unless the heart believes the words that you're speaking. For the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord, which I just did, and you believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Salvation only comes through faith and believing. Hey, if you get a chance, visit our website, eternalrepair.com, where we have a lot more information about your walk with Jesus Christ. That's eternalrepair.com. Thanks for watching.